Welcome to America's Heroes Group. And welcome to America's Heroes Group with our roundtable and our partner, Heinz VA Women's Health Care. Today is Saturday, September 17, 2022. Remember, September is National Suicide Prevention Month and Hispanic Heritage Month. Our host is Cliff Kelly. I'm Sean Claiborne, the co-host. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith, and our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And we have a great show today, and a returning voice, Amy Kashmirshik. Did I say your name right? I can't hear you. You come in silent a little bit. Say can you hear me? I can hear you now. There you go. So she's okay. a, you're a licensed clinical social worker for the Veterans Administration and a clinical care coordinator for the vet for, at the Heinz VA, and have experience in uh, suicide crisis. And we want to talk about suicide prevention and lethal means safety in the veteran population. First of all, what is lethal means safety? What does that exactly entail? Um, is it okay if I talk like this on the phone so you that's, can hear me? That's fine. Okay. Um, okay. So lethal means safety. So what that means is we look at things, items, objects that can be used that someone might use to end their life. Mm-hmm. So things like medications, firearms, sharp objects, uh, ligature tools, those are all lethal means. Um, and lethal means safety measures are one of Um, They're one of the few evidence-based interventions that can help reduce suicide uh, risk in basically every population. So that's why we talk a lot about lethal means safety, um, how to creatively create safe environments for people who might be at risk of a suicide crisis. Should, and this might be a loaded question, but should a person who has a history of suicidal thoughts or maybe has thought about committing suicide, should they own a a weapon? Should they be allowed to own a weapon? Um, You know, from my perspective, um, the VA's perspective is, you know, we're not anti, we're not anti firearm. We're not, I'm, that's not my role here to take someone's firearm away. Um, My role here is to assist people in creating a safe environment. Um, So, and suicide crisis, it kind of, it can come and go very quickly. It can, you know, in different phases of people's lives where they have maybe increased risk factors where they're at this elevated risk for some type of crisis occurring. That's why we empower people, educate people to just be aware of what those risk factors are, um, maybe identify warning signs within themselves as well as warning signs within other people so that, you know, if we're kind of noticing that someone is getting into this zone of risk, we can have a conversation. Okay, so uh, you know you're at this elevated risk because of these risk factors. Can we talk about ways to keep your environment safe? Can we talk about can we uh, keep your firearm in your residence uh, but keep it locked up? Can we keep the ammunition stored separately? Um, can we creatively, you know, involve a family member that is comfortable with firearms? Maybe they can keep the code to a to a safety gun lock or a lock box something like that um you know our perspective at the va is that this stigma around that individuals who have a history of experience of doing a suicidal crisis um you know there is this concept that people avoid getting care because they are afraid of losing their firearms. Um, So that's why we approach, we approach this issue from a lethal means perspective. I'm not here to take away your rights by any means. I'm here to provide you with tools and education about um, suicide crisis, how, how that unfolds and uh, how we can keep your environment safe. I think that's an an important, uh, thing that you brought up is the fact that a lot of veterans are gun owners, but you don't want to have that to be have the fear that they're going to lose their firearm because as mm-hmm. high as it may seem, that firearm could be their security blanket. Correct. Um, and I mean, the reality is that the we know at the VA that that veterans, it's a firearms are a big part of veteran culture. Um, and at the same time, firearms, uh, you know, they have a, 
they've accounted for over 70% of male veteran suicides and nearly 50% of all female veteran suicide deaths, um, according to our last um, annual report that came out uh, from data in 2019, from 2019. Um, So that's why it's so important to talk about this issue um, that, you know, they just have elevated access to firearms. They have a sense of ease with firearms. Um, so, but the reality is that firearms, they account for just this, you know, in comparatively, um, if someone makes an attempt on their life with a firearm, 90%, close to 90% of the time, it ends in a, it results in a fatality compared to 5% of all other um m- basically lethal means so any other if someone attempts to end their life um with any other type of means it's five percent it ends in a in a fatality so and that's that's just the reality of it uh that's that's the data and that's why we want to talk about it and say you know i'm we're not here we're not here to take away firearms we're here you know to give you resources to empower you to notice within yourself as well as you know, your fellow veterans, community members, when things might be heading towards a dangerous zone. Uh, so can we educate people on that and then also give people these tools um, to keep their environment safe? You know, so in my department, um, because we talk so often um, about lethal means safety, we also provide a Uh, like gun locks to all of our clinics. We can um, mail gun locks out to veterans. Um, We basically, if we do an outreach event, we bring gun locks with us. And we basically, we, our perspective is, you know, just make it, make them available and accessible so people can just take them. They don't need to tell me what they're taking it for, who they're taking it for. Um, But we make those available. We also have things like, um, safety, uh, like safe lock boxes. So people, we encourage people, they can keep ammunition in there. Maybe they can keep a handgun in there or, and it's not just firearms. I mean, individuals who, um, they experience really chronic pain or chronic health conditions, or they have, um, sleep disorders and they have medications to deal with those sleep disorders. So these are all things people have access to um, possibly lethal amounts of medication. Mm-hmm. So can we can we encourage people to maybe keep only a finite amount of those medications available? Or um, can we encourage people to lock those medications, opioids, painkillers, uh, sleep aids, uh, in the lockbox so that it um, creates this time and space is what we call what we call it time and space between a suicidal thought and the behavior so actually acting on that thought um, and typically I think it's around uh, 70% of people who um, have a, a suicidal ideation and then end up acting on that on that thought uh, that that typically happens within in 70 percent of cases within one hour of the thought occurring Mm. so if we can just if we can just basically create this time and space give people uh, just barriers to having access really ready um you know impulsive access to these lethal means uh ultimately it's possibly going to save a life just by, by uh, preventing someone or, or making someone wait an hour to get access to that lethal means or what it might be, whether it be a gun or a medication or whatever it might be, that actually can help prevent the suicide. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for a data point that I have on that, but um, most, the vast majority of individuals that um, they vast majority of individuals that experience a suicidal crisis, um, if we can prevent that them from acting on that or 
you know, just reduce reduce the lethality of whatever their plan is. Uh, the vast majority of people do not go on to look for an alternate method to end their lives. So if they have experienced a, you know, suicidal ideation around a firearm, um, and but lethal means safety measures have been um, implemented in their household, and they it helps prevent them from actually acting on that behavior, the vast majority of people do not go on to maybe find another form. Um, And they end up getting through that crisis and pursuing mental health supports, and they end up not dying by suicide. So by keeping that, wherever your poison is, so to speak, um, if Mm -hmm. if it's a gun, if it's medication, if you put that one thing away, just get it out of your sight, get put it where it's hard to get to, where you really, if you really need it, you have to take some time and effort to get to it. That difficulty mm-hmm. of access since can save lives. So as a, so as I guess the message then is find out what your poison is and what is it, if you were to mm-hmm. commit suicide, what's the likely way, what, what, what do you, what do you think about? How do you, what is your ideation of that particular event? Now, mm-hmm. what are the triggers for these ideations typically? Um, you know, it's it's going to be different for every person. And uh, what we talk a lot about is, you know, someone, each individual suicide risk, it's a complex, you know, interaction of, you know, stress or risk factors. Um, and it can, you know, the effect of those risk factors can kind of ebb and flow through life. Um, and a a stressor or a trigger if you you know if you want to call it that um it can be uh, you know a trigger for one person can you know prompt these suicidal thoughts and you know someone else can experience that same trigger and it's not going to prompt those those thoughts um so how do you so recognize them i guess maybe it's a better question how do you recognize when you're in that state and you're getting and you're starting to get to the point where you might want to think about because some people for example have a bad temper but Mm-hmm. There's there's processes and, and techniques that you can use where you know that something is about where you know you're starting to get to a level where you need to cool out, or if you have a heart mm-hmm. condition, you know there's when you're when you're starting to feel a certain way that you got to stop doing whatever mm-hmm. it is that you're doing. Is there anything like that with suicide ideation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we talk a lot about you know I'm I'm not going to get into the whole uh, like suicide safety planning model because that's also that's a model that we use with individuals who have experienced a crisis and are noting you know maybe really chronic suicidal ideation um, and there's a section in safety planning where people identify in themselves you know what their unique specific triggers are um, but we kind of we have a list of uh, what we call warning signs. Um, that if we're noticing maybe a couple of these things happening in someone, that's that's a good indicator that they're at risk of a crisis, whether that ends up being, you know, a suicidal crisis, um, but a crisis either way. So um, I'm just going to kind of list some of the big ones to keep out, keep an eye out for. Um, so things, the number one, uh, you know, warning sign is just general hopelessness. So there are, that feeling that there is no way out and there's no solution to problems. So there's that it's really just black and white thinking. There's no, there's nothing I can do to fix my situation. Um, another one is just an increase in anxiety, agitation, sleeplessness, or mood swings. So if you're, you know, noticing someone, you know, people can experience depression, anxiety, insomnia. But if you're kind of noticing that those things have increased or the the effect of those things is stronger in someone's behavior, that's a warning sign. Um, <clears throat> another one is just noted feelings that there's no reason to live. So people, you know, they really can't speak to um, this is why I this is why I stay alive. This is my purpose. Um, another one, just an increase in rage or anger. So possibly having more outbursts with family and friends, arguments, um, engagement in risky activities. So things, you know, and they don't, they don't really care what the outcome is. Um, so just engaging in these things that would be concerning 
to, you know, and maybe the average person, uh, as well as an increased alcohol or drug use or misuse of their prescription medications. Um, if someone is just experiencing really chronic pain and then along with that, just uh, overwhelming frustration with their chronic health conditions. Um, Another one is social isolation, so withdrawing from family and friends, not wanting to be around people, not wanting to talk about um, other people and kind of distract themselves that way. And then um, the number one, you know, warning sign that should be just like a really big red flag for people is um, looking for ways to die or, you know, researching, researching things like, um, life insurance plans that will pay out in the event of a suicide or um, if someone is attempting to gain access to to some type of lethal means. So maybe someone's trying to get um, access to a stockpile of pain medications or they don't own a firearm and they attempt to uh, gain access to one. And it, you, there's really not a clear reason as to why. A lot of the things you mentioned remind me of um, similar conversations we've had with people that work with um, or deal with or study not just people that commit suicide, but also create acts of violence and, um, and attempt to kill other people, like mass suicide attempts and things of, of that nature. So it seems to be an overlap. Um, and I've mm-hmm. asked this question before to other, other experts. Is, is this the what's the psychology like or um, between someone who or what's the difference between someone who internally hurts themselves wants to commit suicide versus someone that acts out and wants to kill other people? You know, I will say that I'm not I, I can't speak to that exactly. Um, what I what I'll validate in, you know, this just this concept is that there is a lot of overlap in these items. There's going to be um, noticeable, some type of noticeable change in someone's behavior. Um, What we talk a lot about is, um, you know, suicidal thinking, suicidal ideation. It is, it's really common in the population. Mm. Um, It's, it's the vast, you know, people aren't, most people are not going to make an attempt on their life, but most people have likely experienced some type of a suicidal thought. And it's, it's, it's a concerning symptom of a problem that's going on. Um, what sometimes what we refer to it as is, um, you know, a fever is it's normal. Most people have had a fever. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean it's normal and not concerning. Um, So there's going to be some shift in someone's behavior um, when they're experiencing this concerning symptom. Um, So I think a lot of times people end up, you know, when when a death occurs by suicide, um, people well, I think the an, a really frequent messaging is, oh, there was no warning signs that this that this was going to happen. But if we look at it in the, you know, in the if we really look at it, if we look at okay, it seemed like that person didn't, you know, they were noting that they didn't have a purpose in life, or they were really showing that they had difficulty coping with problems so really their coping mechanisms were impaired um and then just some of these changes can seem slight um but also i think people are afraid to uh, ask someone if they're you know thinking about suicide when they notice these things you know these warning signs that we talked about Uh, And that's why, you know, a big part of my role at the VA is we do a lot, a lot, a lot of education on, you know, basic education on how the everyday person can have a conversation with someone that they're that they notice these warning signs. Um, So really just empowering people to know it's not going to make someone make an attempt on their life if you ask them if they're if they thought about it. Um, Amy, that's, we're out of time. I really appreciate the information oh, you've given us. 
Um, that was really no powerful problem. stuff, and I really want to have you back again. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for being a panelist. Yeah. Amy Cash Marischek, she's a licensed clinical social worker at the Veterans Administration and clinical care coordinator for the Veterans VA at the just at the Heinz VA Women's Healthcare. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me during Suicide Prevention Month. My pleasure. This is America's Heroes Group. We'll be right back.